We'll turn to our scripture reading, 1 Peter 5, 7. 1 Peter 5, 7. Um, I'll give you just a moment to open your Bibles to that if you like. I know we all have anxieties in life, and it's wonderful to read this verse. Cast all your anxiety or your cares, it says in some versions, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And uh, we praise God for that. So um, my brother Ed has the sermon today, and we're glad to have him with us. Thank you, Ed. Well, thank you, Deanna. That actually worked out well for me. It gives me a, um, a few more minutes to uh, finish my sermon without feeling guilty about going past that number 12 at the top there. Well, just before uh, I begin, I'd just like to uh, ah, pray one more time. Our Father, which art in heaven, I want to turn this time over to you. Um, I want you to make of some effect the things that will come out of my mouth. I acknowledge my humanity and my failures, and I realize that without your blessing, this will have been a complete waste of time today for all of us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. First Samuel records the uh, unfortunate time in Israel's history when they decided they wanted to be like other nations. Israel was the only nation who acknowledged Jehovah as the one true God. So what they were really saying was, we want to be like the pagan nations. Big mistake. The Lord had uh, Samuel warn the people what the consequences of this would be for having a human rather than almighty God calling the shots. A man named Saul was anointed to be that first king of Israel. 1 Samuel 9 verse 2 tells us that he was handsome. So handsome, in fact, that he is described as the most handsome man in all of Israel. Guys, how would you like to be known as the most handsome man in all of Canada. Can I see your hands? Oh, you are a humble lot. And not only that, uh, but it says there was none as tall. Okay, so tall, dark, and handsome. Woo, at least the optics were good for a new king. But when the time came to install Saul as king, he was nowhere to be found. Um, God finally revealed to the authorities where they could find him. And 1 Samuel 10, 22 reveals that the new king was hiding in the baggage. Hiding in the baggage. Not a good start for a new king. We know, we know, that Saul's hiding in the baggage turned out to be a metaphor for more than suitcases. But his was not the first instant of someone hiding with their baggage. In fact, we can go all the way back to the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve. After they sinned, we too find them hiding where with their baggage. Emotional baggage is a metaphor that refers to our negative, unprocessed emotions from past experiences, 
all types of emotional baggage, if not taken care of, can negatively impact our current experiences, our intimate relationships, our friendships, our family relation, even our careers. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is probably a bit uncomfortable, especially for me, um, you know, being up front here. Um, but I guess we can um, feel some collective camaraderie here because emotional baggage is something psychologists tell us affects every single human being on earth. So every one of you, and, and including me, has had some sort of emotional baggage in our life. Simply being alive means having the capacity to carry past experiences and learning from them, which is healthy and necessary. Uh, it's a necessary behavioral pattern. That's the good news. But there's a point when this baggage becomes too much that it can have a devastating impact on our relationships. One of them is the inability to become emotionally available. Carrying too much emotional baggage can literally stop us from being open to new experiences, intimacy, and growth. And so to repeat, emotional or psychological baggage is a collective term for any unresolved emotional turmoil caused by past childhood trauma, abuse, or any negative experience. But the problem most people have is not that they have emotional baggage. Everyone has some, as I've said. The problem is that they let their emotional baggage rule their lives. It remains unresolved. It becomes seen as normal. Today, I want to go over just six, and this is not an exhaustive list, just six types of emotional baggage that psychologists say impact we human beings negatively. We will conclude with some comments about God's solution to this baggage. So, the first one we're going to look at is dysfunctional family and how it impacts us. Next one, fear, guilt, regret, anger, and negativity or negative thinking. Dysfunctional family. It is estimated that more than two-thirds of children grow up in a non-traditional family environment. And I don't have to list for you the number uh, in society today, the number of non-traditional family environments that children grow up in, uh, so far from God's ideal for his children. Put another way, in the US, one in two children will live with a single parent for various reasons at some point in their lives. And although this isn't considered a dysfunctional family by itself, it does increase the chances of dysfunction uh, occurring as uh, does physical, sexual, and emotional abuse. Physical and emotional neglect witnessing domestic violence, or a parent or a close family member who is an alcoholic, addict, or mentally ill. Here's a few more US statistics, although Canada mirrors uh, the US in many of these, that contribute to the risk factors for dysfunctional families. Remember, hiding in our baggage, and these are all outside of God's plan for humanity. One in eight children today are born to a teen mother. Think babies having babies. One in three children today are born to parents that are unmarried, although they may be cohabiting. The figure in 1980 
was not 33%, but 19%. And if you go all the way back to 1960, the figure was 9%. So it's kind of deteriorating. You see this decline. The numbers are going up of people uh, born to parents that are not uniting in the bond of marriage, which was God's ideal for his children. One out of every 25 kids does not live with either one of their parents. Marketing, time spent on devices, selfishness. You know that the, uh, the targeting by uh, television for children, I mean, less than three years old, they spend $20 billion a year in advertising their garbage to our children. Marketing, time spent on devices, selfishness, and busy schedules that do not allow for quality, positive time spent with each other, and both parents having to work today. I mean, we all face that, don't we? Go to the grocery store, go to the gas pump. These all contribute to the increasing dysfunction in the family. According to Claudia Black in her book, it will never happen to me. Dysfunctional families follow three unspoken rules. Don't talk. When the root of the family's problem is denied and it's not talked about, it can never, ever be resolved. So don't talk. Second one, don't trust. Children don't develop a sense of trust and security in dysfunctional families because their caregivers are inconsistent and undependable. Disrupting the family by talking to a teacher or a counselor just might make things worse. In other words, it is better to deal with the devil that we know than to deal with the devil that we may not know. And lastly, the third one, don't feel. Don't talk, don't trust, don't feel. Rarely are feelings expressed and dealt with in a healthy way. Children witness their families numbing their feelings with alcohol, drugs, food, pornography, and technology. God says in 3 John 1, verse 2, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospers. Number two on our list of triggers or risks for dysfunctional families, fear. Fear is important when it triggers our survival instincts. We know them as our fight or flight response. Sometimes fear is so strong that it can physically paralyze us. Fear prepares us to react to the danger that's presented. Once we sense a potential danger, our body releases hormones that slow or shut down functions not needed for survival, such as our digestive system. They sharpen those uh, hormones, sharpen functions that might help us survive, such as eyesight, our heart rate increases, and blood flows to muscles so that we can run faster <laughs> if needed. Another uh, response, our body also increases the flow of hormones to an area of the brain called the amygdala to help us focus on the presenting danger and uh, to store it in memory so that uh, if it happens again, we can remember how we responded, what worked, what didn't, all of those interesting things. The brain stores all the details surrounding the danger, the sights, the sounds, the odors, the time of day, the weather and so forth. This may then serve as a predictor of threat. Again, we use that information to realize, hey, this is happening here. This is potentially becoming a dangerous situation. An example might be a soldier uh, who experienced uh, a bombing on a foggy night. He might find himself panicking when the weather turns foggy without knowing why. Chronic fear weakens our immune system, 
can cause cardiovascular damage, gastrointestinal problems such as ulcer, ulcers and uh, irritable bowel syndrome, and decreased fertility. It can also lead to accelerated aging and even premature death. Fear can impair formation of long-term memories and damage parts of the brain that can leave a person anxious most of the time. Fear can interrupt processes in our brains that allow us to regulate emotions and even act ethically. Other consequences of chronic fear include fatigue, clinical depression, and PTSD. When Samuel uh, told Saul that the Lord had rejected him from being king because of his disobedience, Saul's excuse, as recorded in 1 Samuel 15, 24, was, I feared the people and obeyed their voice. You may recall he was supposed to wait for Samuel to offer a sacrifice, and Samuel got delayed, and so Saul went ahead. And of course, right after he did it, guess who showed up? Samuel. Fear caused Adam and Eve to hide from their best friend. Similarly, fear caused Sarah to lie to heaven's visitors who came to let her know that she would have a son. Canadian astronaut Chris Hatfield once said, you don't enter space with your fingers crossed. The more you know, the less you fear. How well do we know Jesus? Job experience was recorded in uh, the book named after him, Job chapter 3, verses 25 and 26. What I always feared has happened to me. It seemed to become a self-fulfilling prophecy. What I dreaded has come true. I have no peace, no quietness. I have no rest. Only trouble comes. And in 1 John 4, 18, uh, offers us a, perhaps a better perspective of that. There is no fear in love, for perfect love casts out fear because fear has torment. And uh, one last text on that, 2 Timothy 1, uh, 1 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Number three on our list of triggers or risks for dysfunction. Guilt. Like fear, guilt has a purpose. It is a corrector, a moral compass. Guilt tells us that something is very wrong and it needs correcting. Scripture is clear that all humanity is guilty before a holy God. However, when it comes to feeling guilty, we must determine if it is true guilt or false guilt. False guilt is when we feel guilty but are innocent of any wrongdoing. It can make you imagine things that aren't really there, such as God hates me and doesn't want anything to do with me. In relationships, this means having a constant fear that you're always disappointing your partner, that you're not living up to expectations, or that you deserve the abuse that you are suffering. False guilt originates in ourselves by believing lies about ourselves or from Satan, who is the accuser of the brethren. Revelation tells us that. True guilt originates with the Holy Spirit and requires godly sorrow leading to repentance. Hannah, you may recall, experienced false guilt, cursed of God, I think is how scripture puts it, for not providing a son for Elkanah, even though it was obviously not her fault. 1 Samuel 1 verse 5 reveals that the Lord had shut up her womb. The constant harassment that Hannah received from Elkanah's other wife, Penina, who had several children, only further heightened Hannah's pain. Carrying unresolved guilt can impact us negatively in both physical 
and spiritual ways. The most common physical consequences are poor concentration, difficulty learning new things, and bad short-term memory, or even finding yourself struggling to find the right word you're thinking of while talking. These symptoms could be a sign of brain fog caused by holding on to unresolved guilt. If our guilt causes us to seek comfort food, guess what the result is going to be? We're going to gain unwanted weight. Usually our comfort food is not the most healthy. Unresolved guilt usually leads to feeling depressed, causing some to even do harm to themselves. God says in Romans 8, verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Number four on our list of dysfunctions, uh, risks for uh, dysfunction triggers, regret. Regret is defined as sorrow aroused by circumstances beyond one's control or power to repair. Nothing else makes you live in the past quite like regret. If only are two dangerous words that can make you blind and stop you from living your life in the moment. Regret tends to be a long-lasting emotion since the actions that cause the regret cannot be changed. It happened a while ago. While regret can be beneficial by helping those experiencing it to gain insight and to improve future decisions that they have to make, um, it is more commonly associated with negative effects that it can have on a person's happiness due to a bias in one's decision making, resulting in poor choices. Anxiety caused by repeatedly thinking about the perceived better choice that you could have made and chronic feelings of sadness. Um, uh, varying degrees of guilt, shame, and anger. A synonym is contrition. God says in Psalm 34, 18, the Lord is near to those who are a, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, the Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and save such as have a contrite spirit. In Psalm 51, 17, we read, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. One biblical example of regret that comes to my mind would be the prodigal son. That experience, as painful as it was for him, finally permitted contrition to do its good work, and he humbly sought forgiveness from his father. And his father was happy not only to provide forgiveness, but restoration as well. Number five on our list of triggers uh, for dysfunction, anger, anger. Anger is perhaps the most easily identifiable baggage, emotional baggage. When we get rejected or hurt by someone in the past, we tend to carry that resentment with us. Anger is also the most difficult emotional baggage to let go of, the most difficult. Bottled up anger and resentment are often taken out on, most on the people we love the most. If we keep anger as baggage in our life, we will keep happiness and love at bay until we learn how to let it go. When we are angry, the adrenal glands flood, note the word, flood the body with stress hormones such as adrenaline and cortisol. Heart rate, blood pressure, respiration, and body temperature all increase and the skin perspires. Side effects are headache, 
digestion problems, insomnia, anxiety, depression, high blood pressure, skin problems such as eczema, heart attack, and stroke. Some people who fly into rages have low self-esteem and use their anger as a way to manipulate others and feel powerful. God says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Ephesians 4, verses 31 and 32. Ephesians 4, verses 31 and 32. And the last one on our list this morning, six, uh, negativity or negative thinking. It's part of our emotional baggage. Are you always expecting the worst in life and in people? Do you focus on negative things that happened rather than blessings? Is your glass half full or half empty? You might think that by seeing the world negatively, you'll protect yourself from hurt and unmet expectations, but you're wrong. Constant negative thinking is not only harmful to you, but also to the people you love. Negativity can lead to hmm, cynicism, whining, discontent, and here's a tough one for Christians, perfectionism. Everything looks bad, so maybe I'm the right one. In close relationships, this can form toxic behaviors and create unnecessary conflict between you and those you love because it leads you to take everything personally in a negative light, never giving the benefit of the doubt to the other person. According to the power uh, of positivity, there are three leading causes of negative thoughts which shouldn't come as any surprise to any Christians. Here they are. Fear of the future, anxiety about the present, and shame about the past. Fear of the future, anxiety about the present, and shame about the past. Here are five questions to ask yourself whenever you are tempted to have a negative thought arise. Number one, is the thought true? Is there a basis for this negative belief? Philippians 4.8 comes to mind. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, Whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Number two, question. Is the thought, this negative thought that's going through your mind, giving you power or is it taking it away from you. 2 Timothy 1, 7, I read this already, for God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I guess one other thought that just popped into my head could be that when we find ourselves thinking negative things, perhaps about other people, we might ask ourselves, would Jesus allow himself to go this far down this path? Third question you may want to ask yourself when you find yourself thinking negative thoughts, can you put a positive spin on this thought or learn from it? Job 36, 22 says, Behold, God exalteth by his power. Who teacheth like him? He's a good teacher. He'll teach you how to put positive things on that. Fourth question you may want to find yourself asking when you're thinking negative thoughts, what would your life look like if you didn't have these negative beliefs? What would your life look like if you didn't carry, if you didn't allow these negative thoughts and beliefs to, uh, to occur? 
Well, how about a sound mind, for starters? I'm going back to 2 Timothy 1.7 again. Um, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And lastly, ask yourself this question, is the thought glossing over an issue that needs addressing? Hebrews 12, verses 6 and 7. This is from the voice translation. For the Lord disciplines those he loves. If he wants to correct you, allow him. And he corrects each one he takes as his own. Negative thinking habits like constantly reflecting on the past and worrying about the future may likely cause, this is something, you know, as we get to be this hair color, we may think about this more often, may likely cause cognitive, cognitive decline and eventually lead to that dreaded D word, dementia. Research is at the Department of Mental Health at University College London, England, found that people who spend more time harboring negative thoughts were found to have more tau and beta amyloid deposits in their brains, which are two proteins that play major roles in the development of Alzheimer's disease, the most common form of dementia. Habitual negative thoughts can also cause cardiovascular problems, digestive issues, and cause one to recover from sickness much more slowly than a person with a positive mindset. Frequent criticism, cynical thoughts, and denial can create, listen to this one, neural pathways in the brain that encourage sadness. Frequent criticism, cynical thoughts, and denial can create neural pathways in the brain that encourage sadness. These negative tendencies can cause our brain to distort the truth and make it even more difficult to break the negative cycle. Some of the common effects of negativity include, this list is actually quite common when you look at it. Headache, chest pain, fatigue, upset stomach, sleep problems, anxiety, depression, social withdrawal, and drastic changes in metab metabolism, such as uh, overeating or undereating. Scripture reminds us that God has cast our sins of the past into the depths of the sea, and better yet, he remembers them no more. In closing, to clearly and powerfully explain God's solution to the baggage problem. I will be quoting from a book written by Dr. Mark Sandoval. He's a medical doctor. Some of you may uh, know of him because of his work at Uchi Pines uh, Health uh, Retreat in Alabama. Uh, his book is called The Law of Life. Uh, my wife and I have this reading. It's something we highly recommend. You will find in there uh, a different take on dealing with health issues that my guess is, I'd be willing to bet, you've probably uh, never followed that line of thinking of the, the, the source of disease, uh, illness, uh, amongst us. So uh, we recommend that. Anyways, um, these are some of the things she said, and then we will close. You and I have a past. And each past is unique. Unfortunately, that past has the tendency to determine our life in the future, often sending us in the wrong direction. What do we do about the past? Is there a solution to the things we have already suffered? Is there freedom from the baggage that we have carried with us for years and years? There is, and the solution is found at the cross. Jesus, the unwearied servant of man's necessities, the one who poured himself into a hurting humanity to raise us up from the fall, the one who sacrificed all heaven and the constant adoration of the angelic host, the one who created all creatures great and small, the one who came to reveal God to man and restore the breach made by sin, Jesus bore our sin. No, more than this, 
He became our sin. That's what Scripture says. It is one thing to carry sin, but to become sin? I can't comprehend this. To think that Jesus, the Son of God, who had never been separated from his Father in the span of all eternity, became, in some way, the very thing his Father hated, the very thing that separates us from God, why would he do it? 2 Corinthians 5.22 says he wanted to accomplish something incomprehensible, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This is why he became sin. I can't comprehend that either. I know myself. I know how much I fail. I know my wandering thoughts, mistakes, and rebellions. I know my stubborn will. And yet Jesus became sin so that I might become the righteousness of God. In order to accomplish this incomprehensible feat, he had to go to the cross. What was the life of Christ like before the cross? Jesus was perfect, unselfish, had no personal hurts, was loving, always responded perfectly, and overcame all temptation and sin because of his perfect life and the perfect influence that it had. Jesus had no baggage. That life is worthy of eternal life. But what about you and me? What is our life like before the cross? We are sinful with no room for righteousness. We always take what others say and do personally. We have a selfish love, which is why we take things personally and take things into our own hands. We have acted poorly toward others, hurting them by our words, actions, or influence. And we are victims, having had many things happen to us that we have had no control over and which are responded poorly to. We are powerless to overcome any temptation and sin from a pure motive. Therefore, our overcoming temptation is through bad motives, which itself is sin. And all this fills our heavy suitcase, which is our baggage, worthy of the penalty of death. Time does not permit us to go through the sanctuary service that illustrates the exchange that took place. But I do want to share some thoughts on God's solution for our baggage. We're almost done, folks. On the cross, Jesus takes our place. He steps into the gun barrel of our lives and takes the bullet that our lives deserve. He takes the responsibility for our sinfulness and selfishness. He takes the results of us taking things personally. He takes the penalty of being the perpetrator and the consequences of being the victim. He takes the powerlessness of human flesh to overcome temptation and sin. He not only takes the responsibility for the things that were said and done, but also the negative influence and effects that those things has had and will have on others. He takes our baggage for us, the death that our lives deserves. Jesus suffers. In addition to doing all of this, Jesus does something else. As Jesus steps into the gun barrel of our lives and takes the force of all that it deserves. He gently places us in the gun barrel of his life. When he does so, we receive eternal life and all of the other blessings and benefits that his perfect life deserves. And the gun barrel guides the bullet directly towards the bullseye of the target, which is holiness. We receive his power to overcome all temptation and sin. We no longer have to be controlled by our past and our negative responses. We can con be controlled by Jesus' past and his perfect responses filled with his power.
When we enter into the experience of this divine exchange of life for life, history for history, past for past, offered to us because of God's sacrifice at the cross, Jesus' record becomes ours in the books of heaven. We are accounted perfect and we no longer have any baggage. In many cases, there are consequences from our past that still have to be dealt with, but in our minds and on heaven's record, we are free. Jesus paid the price for every human being, but not all will benefit from this gift of grace. There are many who will be lost because they do not take personally what has been provided. Faith is our action that takes of what God has provided and makes it our own. It is believing that God's gift of this divine exchange is for me. It is accepting that gift as my own and trusting that it is true for me. Now, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You see, God has a plan to heal us from the current emotional hurts that we suffer. That plan involves giving us a new heart by grace through faith. God also has a plan to save us from our past baggage. That plan involves the divine exchange made possible at the cross by grace through faith. If we are still carrying our baggage and living in an experience before the cross, it is because we have not come to the cross and accepted by faith the divine exchange made possible for us by God's grace. Do you want to be free? Our closing song will be brought to us by the Gaither Vocal Band. Let's bow our heads. Our Father, which art now, I just want to thank you for being with us today. Oh Lord, we looked at six. <laughs> There's probably 6,000 things that can impact us negatively cause dysfunction in our lives in this old world. Um, but, you know, it doesn't matter if it's six or six thousand or six million. Our Savior's death on the cross and his desire that we become partakers of the divine nature, as scripture puts it, um, reveals his great love for us and he can meet every challenge. We're grateful for the peace that this brings to our hearts. And Lord, as we, uh, each one, face the things that uh, have troubled us, have probably uh, impacted us in possibly negative ways, um, I pray that we'll find the solutions in Jesus and uh, lay them aside and look forward to that day when we, uh, our company will be in the midst of holy beings, angels, and uh, mm, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Um, we are so looking forward to that day, Lord, and to end this experiment with sin. We're grateful for all you've done and are doing in Jesus' name. Amen.